open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. This is Michael Brentlinger, and Michael comes today to be born again of the water and born of the Spirit. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So Michael, I want to ask you a question first this morning. Do you and have you repented of your sins? Yes. Would you repeat this confession of faith with me? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And I accept him now. And I accept him now. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Michael, upon your confession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, <laughs> resurrection.
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise in years and they're forever more bless the Lord of oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh So we have this time of communion and um, honor this name that's above every name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. with us. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
Let me begin today with a question. Do you ever look around and say, in your little circle or your medium circle or your big circle, do you ever look around and say, this thing's totally out of control? Do you ever feel like the events in America and the world today are absolutely, totally out of control? We're in the middle of the political season leading up to November. And I'm going to tell you, these people are nuts. Amen. These people are nuts. <laughs> Let's be honest, the culture has shifted. I hope you come to church because the church is a source of truth. The culture has shifted greatly and things seem, and I focus on the word seem, to be out of control. I've always considered myself to be a patriot. Let me tell you where I'm going with this. I was raised in a very patriotic house. Um, I've always considered myself to be a patriot, one who took pride in my country and thus when I graduated high school at the age of 17, I volunteered to serve in the Army while the Vietnam War was going on. Now, looking back, that didn't seem very smart. I've often looked back and thinking, whoo, that was not an intelligent decision, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. You see, I grew up in the generation, and all I know is what I know from my life experience. I, I felt like the American way of life was, was worth fighting for. And I felt like this way of life was worth preserving and sharing with the rest of the world. This idea of freedom, this idea of liberty, this idea of prosperity. But I admit today... I admit today that something has happened to me since I was a 17-year-old army private. Let me explain. I've always felt like the American way of life aligned itself with my Christian way of life. Let me say it again. 
I have always experienced personally that the American way of life aligned itself with my Christian way of life. There was no significant conflict in the way of life, in the way of living between my political world and my spiritual world. They were not in conflict with each other. I honestly can't say that today. In fact, I will say that the American way of life that is being advanced in our modern culture stands opposed to the Christian way of life that I intend to live. The moral truths that I grew up with were in, supported and embraced by the American society overall. As I grew up, as my generation grew up, the moral truths that defined who I was, what I believed, how I desired to live my life, they aligned themselves pretty much with the American way of life, the American culture. Even though I admit when I say that, that not everyone was a Christian. I, I get it. However, the moral truths of Christianity, the Judeo-Christian belief system, wasn't considered hostile, not in my youth. It wasn't hostile to society. It was the very foundation of the society that has now changed. And I think it's healthy to go on and acknowledge it. That has now changed. And I see something. I see my Christian faith to be in direct opposition to the American way of life. This is new. This is new. This is a culture shift. And because they are in conflict with each other, I am forced to choose which way of life will I live. I begin this part this morning by saying this. Everybody listen. Everything is still under control. It may seem like it's out of control. But everything is still under control. No matter how crazy things look today, everything is still under control. The foundations that set this nation up as the greatest and most powerful nation on earth have been under attack, and they have seemingly been brought under the control of Satan. But I tell you something today, I proclaim the truth. Everything, everything, past, present, future, is still under control today. I tell you today that God is still on his throne. Jesus is sitting at his right hand with all power, dominion, and authority under his control. God is not wringing his hands in disbelief at world events that seem to have replaced truth and the authority of his word. I'm not going to act like I understand all of this today. I'm not going to pretend like I do, but I do know that some things must happen. Let me say it again. I'm not going to come up here today and pretend like I've got all this figured out, the spiritual and the physical and everything out of control, under control. I know this. I know this. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And listen, some things must happen. They must happen. And they must happen before Jesus will return. Some things must happen. They must take place. It's not out of control. They are in total control. Let me give you an example. Peter and ten others were with Jesus. Peter and ten others were with Jesus on that Thursday night when the soldiers came to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Everybody listen. Peter and ten others are with Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane, Thursday night. Here comes the soldiers. Jesus is praying. Is that out of control? That event, that scene. Most of you know what happened that night. It seemed out of control. Was it out of control? Was the scene out of control? I'm going to tell you, Peter thought it was. If you'd asked Peter, stop in the middle, push pause, Peter, 
right now when all the soldiers have just grabbed Jesus. Judas has just kissed him and betrayed him. Peter, do you think everything's under control? Peter would say, you're nuts. This is a mess. This is a mess. Peter thought it was, but was it out of control or, or, or is it absolutely, positively, 100% in control of God? Let me read a part of that. Matthew 26, and even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. Is this out of control? It looks out of control. You let a bunch of people come to your house with swords and clubs. It's going to seem out of control. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him this kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and they arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and he struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Now, if you read the other Gospels, you'll know that's Peter. Peter's pulled his sword out. Why? Because things are out of control. I can bring things back in control with this little shiny thing. Right? That's what he's thinking. Put away your sword, Jesus told Peter. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize, everybody listen to me, because it's really not me, it's Jesus telling the story. Don't you realize that I could ask my Father for thousands of angels to protect us, and He would send them, how fast? Instantly. Angels are quick. He would send them instantly. But if I did, here it comes, here it comes. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day, but this is all happening. <laughs> Is this out of control? No. This is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. Peter, put up your sword. You guys think this is out of control? This is absolutely in control. This is happening right now because the prophets were told by God. They wrote it down. And I wrote it down so that you would know that when it does happen, that it's from me. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. In control, out of control. If you and I were standing there that night, we would think that this is absolutely out of control. Right? Right? Anybody would. I'm not picking on Peter. I'm not, well, they're running. All the guys have just run. It's out of control, Jesus. He's just told them this is happening to fulfill the prophecy, the Word of God. And then they still run. Oh, okay, so it's in the Bible? Let's stay. No, they ran. Let me repeat verse 52, 52 and 54. I want you to... Jesus is clarifying something today in this room, right now in America. We need to hear this, church. Put away your sword. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. You know what the sword is a picture of? The sword is a picture of man's response to what he thinks is out of control. It's like I can take control and bring things under control. Can Peter, that night in the garden, take control and bring things under control? No, Peter's going to mess stuff up if that was even possible. In fact, what's Jesus do? Let's go put the guy's ear back on. Peter, Peter. 
Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? You see, the scriptures are under control. <laughs> Listen, you know, we'd all be better off if we got that first sentence. The scriptures are under control. The scriptures are under control. This is the power in the word of God. It's under control. And the scriptures have announced that some things must happen. Even if those things look to us to be out of control, some things must happen. They are under the control of the Word of God, the Scriptures of God, which is the Word of God announced by God in advance. The Scriptures have announced that some things must happen before Jesus comes to reign. Did you know that? You've been in this church very long. You ought to know that. Some things must happen before Jesus can come back, will come back to reign. Those things will seem out of control. Those things will seem out of control, but they are not. They are under the control of God. Jesus again announces that these things must happen before he returns. I want to go to Matthew 24, verse 4, and it seems out of control, or is it? Some things must happen. You won't be able to say you didn't know in advance because, yes, you do know in advance. Verse 4, Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. You know, I think that's a message specifically for the modern church. Some of you are starting to get toward a panic. Don't panic. Let's do this. Everybody take a breath, okay? Everybody, one, one two, three. Don't that feel better? Don't panic. It's okay. Some of you are right now in the period of your life where you're Peter pulling out the sword thinking, I'm going to have to get a handle on things around here. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in many parts of the world. And all of this is only the first of birth pains and there's more to come. And then you, uh-oh, then you will be arrested, persecuted, killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Will you say that sentence with me out loud? The one who endures to the end will be saved. Let's do it again. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom, I'm going to hold it up. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached. He can't stop it. Satan cannot stop it. You can pull out swords. You can't stop it. And the good news will be preached throughout the whole world. So that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. And then the end will come, but not until everything seems out of control. Not until everything seems out of control. Did you hear what I just said? It's going to seem like everything is out of control. In the middle of the everything out of control, there's going to be people preaching the Word of God in the strangest places to the strangest people. And then the end will come. Did you think the church was going to convert the whole world to Christianity and then Jesus was going to return? Come on. Sometimes I see people in the church and I wonder, did you really think that the 
church was going to preach the gospel to the whole world. They were all going to come to Christ. We're all going to hold hands, circle the world, sing Kumbaya, and Jesus comes. Is that it? I got a question. Did you think things were going to get better and better and every nation would have a big revival and then Jesus would come back? If so, where'd you get that? I'm asking. If so, where did you get that? Not from this book. You did not get that from here. You know where you got that? You got that? If I was in charge, that's what would happen. If I was in charge, we'd preach. Everybody would come except Christ. We'd all be brothers and sisters. We'd live in peace forevermore. Let me repeat verse 9 through 14 again. But this is what the truth is. You will be arrested. You'll be persecuted. Some of you are going to be killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin is going to be rampant everywhere. The love of many, it's going to grow cold. It's going to disappear. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Why is Jesus telling us this? Why did he write it down? Why has it been preserved? Why do you have it in English? Why am I reading it today in this room right now? And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it and the end will come. Don't panic. It's under control. It's going to get bad, but it's under control. Things are not going to get better. Church, things are not going to get better, even though I still believe many will repent and turn to Christ. The world as a whole is going to get worse and worse and worse. What makes this unusual for Americans is this. We have never had to deal with minority status before. But you are now. How's it feel? Why we're so stressed out is as a nation, we've never as Christians dealt with minority status. But we're starting to learn what that feels like. I don't like it at all. Most of us have lived much of our lives with our nation's values matching our Christian values without any conflict. Most of us have been able to live out our American way of life without compromising our Christian way of life. But I'm telling you today, those days are gone. You better accept it. Now there is a conflict between the two. And we're having to live like the rest of the world has had to live for a long time. The rest of the world has understood what minority status is. You try being a Christian in North Korea. You try being a Christian in China or Saudi Arabia. We need to face reality. The world has opposed the church since the first day of the church. It's just in America, we've experienced a blessing that most of us never realized was there. In fact, the, the world will always be against the church. Before the church, let me give you some physical examples and I'll lead up to something. Before the church was initiated by Jesus Christ, before the church, there was Daniel. And Daniel lived under the control of the Babylonians. Understand this about Daniel. Daniel was a Jewish young man when Jerusalem fell. He was carried off as a captive slave to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. Daniel lived under the control of Babylon as long as Babylon didn't conflict with God's authority in Daniel's life. You got to understand this when I start today. Daniel acknowledged the authority of the nation of Babylon, the king Nebuchadnezzar. He acknowledged the authority of the nation over him until the nation over him conflicted with his faith. 
as long as the two, the, the political realm and the spiritual realm, could work together, Daniel acknowledged the authority of government. But what would Daniel do when they became in conflict with each other? When, they, when the government refused to acknowledge the spiritual realm? Have you ever noticed that Daniel was a revered leader in Babylon? Think about that for a moment. Daniel was a revered leader in Babylon, and then some powers in Babylon did something. Please don't miss this. Daniel was a revered leader, respected leader. And then some people in Babylon's government changed the laws. Stay with me. They changed the laws. And changing the laws brought the political in conflict with the spiritual. It didn't used to be that way, but somebody changed the laws and brought them into conflict. Americans might find some comfort in this story because there are many also changing our laws today. Right now, You're living in the generation that is experiencing the government changing the laws so that the laws now conflict with the spiritual life that Christians desire to live. In 1973, they issued a law. They changed the laws. In 1973, they changed the laws so that abortion was now a civil right. It was your right. Nobody can interfere with your rights. 57 million people since 73 have died. They're people. They're people. They're people. They're dead. Somebody changed the laws. And now you're living in a generation where now gay marriage, men are marrying men, women are marrying women. Now, now listen, for most of our lives in the American culture, somebody had a set of laws. They, they matched up with God's laws, and we could live the American way of life and the Christian way of life, and we didn't conflict very much, but somebody's changed the laws. And even now, last week, I mean, it, it blows my mind. And no, I will not be silent. No, no, there is no silence in the church. The church is the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And we have a president who has now issued letters to every school system in this United States saying that, that men and women can choose their gender based upon their feelings any day anytime. And that school systems need to now open up facilities so that what? Boys can shower with the girls in the locker room. See, what, somebody's changed the laws. There was a generation that we could walk as a Christian in the American culture and submit to the government's authority because we didn't conflict with each other. And then somebody changed the laws. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? Is this out of control? Or is this in control? You better figure out which one that is. Daniel served King Nebuchadnezzar with honor and distinction without compromising the laws of God. Listen carefully. Daniel served the guy who replaced King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. He served him with honor and distinction without compromising the laws of God. Here's a man in government, high-level government. And he serves the government with honor and distinction. No compromise to his faith. Nebuchadnezzar, and then here comes Belshazzar. And Daniel, he served King Darius. Read the book. He served King Darius with honor and distinction without compromising the laws of God. And then something happened. Somebody changed the laws. Did, it seem, did that seem out of control? Let me read it to you. Daniel 6.1. Darius the Mede, he was the king of actually not just Babylon, but that whole region. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. He appointed a high officer to rule over each province, and he chose Daniel. He chose a Jew. 
You think that was popular? Well, you need to read the rest of the story to find out that one. So he chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. (laughs) Daniel's not in conflict with the government. Daniel is the incredible servant to the government. What? If he wasn't, he wouldn't have been put in charge of the whole empire. Daniel's a Jew, and even though King Darius liked Daniel, many did not. You know why? They don't like Jews. Daniel was loyal to this new king of Babylon, and he served with distinction. No conflict, not yet. But somebody, listen church, somebody is about to change the laws. Was this out of control? Verse 4. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. It's hard to dig up any dirt on anybody like that. So they concluded, here it comes, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Can I give you a hint? Satan is consistent in his strategy. Today is the same. The only chance of finding grounds to accuse Daniel or the church will have to be in connection with the rules of their religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors that the king should make a new law. Uh Uh-oh. That the king should make a new law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that the next, for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, makes me want to gag. Are are they trying to elevate the king? Are they trying to take down Daniel? How will they do it? It'll be make a law that conflicts with his religion. Give orders that the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions. And now your majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. What's Daniel going to do when he hears that the Supreme Court has issued a decree? That's what it is. What's Daniel going to do now that the Supreme Court has issued its ruling that is in direct conflict with the laws of his God? Can I ask you a question? What would you do? If you're Daniel in that scene, what would you do? Well, I need to go along. Or or what would you do today if the Supreme Court issued a ruling that was in direct conflict with your faith? Would you go along? Should you go along? Is this out of control? Listen very carefully before I read the next verse. Listen. Daniel, Daniel knows that the law has been changed. It's not that he doesn't know that the Supreme Court has just ruled that you can't pray to anyone human or divine for 30 days. What's Daniel going to do? You think this has any application to us in this room today? You better believe it does. You see, Daniel knew that the law had been changed and that disobeying the law would bring the death penalty. Verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, okay, he knows, he knows. When Daniel learned that the law had been signed, 
he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. Shouldn't he have shut the window? He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and they found him praying and asking for God's help. What was he, what was he doing? He's asking for God's help. Why? Because he knows that troubles are brewing. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is the official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, that Jew, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. Daniel knelt down as usual. He didn't hide. He didn't shut the windows. Daniel bowed and he faced Jerusalem three times a day. As usual, nothing changed. You see, Daniel grew up in Babylon and his religion did not conflict. When it did, he chose to follow God. And somebody changed the laws. This event would have happened late in Daniel's life. And thus Daniel had lived most of his life without any conflict in this area of prayer to God. But somebody did something. Somebody changed the laws. Is this out of control or absolutely in control? Do you think this event is out of control or absolutely in control? And I need to ask a third question. What would you have done? And what will you do now? You see, they did throw Daniel in the lion's den. And God did rescue Daniel from the lion's den. And God did something that makes me want to clap and cheer. He, he then made Darius throw those scoundrels in the lion's den. Should I not be happy about that? I'm struggling with that one. Verse 19, very early the next morning, the king got up and he hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God. You see the influence Daniel, a man of God, was having in the kingdom? Daniel, man of God. Was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lion's? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and he ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. Ooh. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, and he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Who's become the preacher? Come on, somebody, who became the preacher? The king has become the preacher. Why? Because Daniel went along? Nope. 
The king became the preacher because Daniel wouldn't go along. Now the message is being preached in the entire kingdom. Why? Because Daniel went along? No, because Daniel wouldn't go along. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So I've got four questions. Here we go. This is when it gets serious. Now we're going to have practical application time. I've got four questions. You see, here's the problem. We see this Daniel story and we say, yes, God's in control. But here comes the four questions. Is God in control? Yeah. Daniel, he's delivered. Those scoundrels got what was coming. Here's the four questions. What if the lions had eaten Daniel? Is God still in control? What if they'd eaten Daniel? What if we read this story and Daniel got eight? Question number two. Did Daniel get a guarantee from God that the lions wouldn't eat him before he went to bow down in his room with the windows open? Question number three. Is God only in control when believers escape death? Question number four. Is God only in control when believers escape persecution and suffering? Daniel had three Hebrew servants that served with him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, like Daniel, refused to bow to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Why? Do anybody see something here? Because I do. In Daniel's story and in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story and in our story, there is a common denominator. Somebody changed the laws. Somebody changed the laws. And the government that you used to live in harmony with now is in conflict with my faith. And what am I going to do about that? You see, they changed the laws to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They put up this big golden statue, and then they they made this new law. It's a new law. And the new law is, you've got to, when you hear the sound of music, you've got to bow down to this statue. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're not going to, that's against our law. We, We can't bow to a false idol. You see, if you don't, you're going to get burned in a fiery furnace. And here's my question. Did they know in advance? Did God come to them? Did God come to Daniel? Did God come to you and say that you should go along with the government until it conflicts with you? But if it conflicts with you, I'll rescue you from anything the government might do. Now go on and be brave. There's no guarantees, are there? But is God in control? That's the question. Is he in control? Is he only in control when he rescues you? You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, and, and Daniel, they all believed and trusted God that he had everything under control, no matter how it turns out. Daniel 3.13, then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. Why? Because he's heard there's three Jews who won't bow down to the new law. To the new law. It's a new law. Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, and he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? I will give you one more chance. (laughs) What would you do? What would you do? You get one more chance to go along. I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made. When you hear the sound of musical instruments, but if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able, is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, 
Oh, they have considered both options. They have already in advance considered the alternative. What if God says, today's your day, fellas? But even if he doesn't, we want, we want to make it clear to you, Nebuchadnezzar, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. We will never Live or not live, we will never serve your gods. But even if he doesn't, he is still in control. Do you believe that? Church, do you believe that? And even if he doesn't save your life, he's still in control. You think that day that Nebuchadnezzar and God were in a contest and Nebuchadnezzar tried, but he just couldn't overcome God? If he doesn't rescue you from suffering, persecution, and death, is he still in control? Let, let me give you the real example. Here we go. Here we go. Stephen died. They stoned him to death for preaching Jesus. Is that out of control? Peter died. Peter died. Crucified upside down. At least that's what history tells us. You know why he died? He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul died. You see an alarming trend? Paul died. He was beheaded by the Roman emperor. Why? All of them got the same issue for preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. John the Baptist died, they cut his head off because he spoke against the sexual sin that was endorsed by the government. <gasps> Did you know that? John the Baptist died, they cut his head off because he preached out loud against the sexual sin that was endorsed by the government. Is this stuff out of control? John the Baptist was not politically correct. It cost him his head. And do you know what Jesus said about John? <laughs> Luke 7, 28. Jesus says, I tell you of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. And what did John do? He preached out loud without apology about the sexual sin that was being announced and supported by the government. What about us today? Really, everything I've said today is to bring us to this practical application point from the Scriptures for us in the room today. Philippians 3.17. Here it comes, church. Are you ready? Say, uh-huh. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. The Apostle Paul's writing this. Pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often, I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, there are many whose conduct show that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Did you know he said brothers and sisters? You know he's writing to a church? There are many whose conduct show they're really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think only about this life, this moment. They think only about this life here on this earth. The right now. But we, no, no, here comes the contrast. There's a different way of thinking. But we are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies. He will take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything, everything under his control.
and draw. Paul makes a summary in Philippians. Brothers and sisters, pattern your life after me. And then we on this side look at that and say, but, 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 they cut your head off. Pattern my life after you and they cut your head off. Where's Paul today? You think he got his head back? Many are living their lives as enemies of the cross of Christ. Cross of Christ. And you know what Paul's saying? Do not, do not be deceived. Do not go along with them. Many are headed for destruction. They follow their appetite. They follow their sensual desires. Whatever is sensual inside of them, that must be where I go. Many are only thinking about today, and they never consider eternity, past, present, future. Is it under control or not? You see, the world only wants to deal with this one, this one, only this one. I want the present to satisfy me. They never take in mind all the events of the past, which tell us clearly the events of the future. I only want now. Brothers and sisters, we are citizens of heaven, and that's where our king now resides. And I'm going to tell you today, everything is under his control. The kingdom of heaven has not changed its laws. I'm going to hold them up without apology. I have lived most of my life where the government and I did not conflict. And then the government is now changing its laws. And I know for a fact that the kingdom of heaven has not changed its laws. His law stands. Past, present, future. We're eagerly waiting for our king to come as our savior. My response is Maranatha, Hosanna, hallelujah, amen. Come soon, Lord. Save us. Begin to reign. Make it so. And when he comes, this is going to happen. This is not maybe going to happen. This is going to happen. It's verse 21. He will take our weak mortal bodies. He's going to change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. He's coming. Now, either you believe this or you don't. You don't a little bit believe that. You don't almost believe that. Jesus didn't come. Listen, some of you are going to be surprised at what's coming out of my mouth right now. Jesus did not come to change the culture. He came to seek and save the lost. And there will be many who are lost. He came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was Jesus' focus and it must be our focus as the church today. We must seek and save the lost. If we could change the government... Listen, if we could change the government. Some of you are following the election. See, it's out of control. And if we could just get the right man in that job. We already have a king. His name is Jesus. If we could change the government and all the leaders, it would not change the culture. Because the culture cannot be changed by government. The culture cannot be changed by a government. I have no hope in Democrats. I have no hope in Republicans. My hope is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. That does not mean we disconnect ourselves from the political world. No, I think we should be heavily engaged in the political world as long as you realize it's already under the control of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's got this. The culture is the combined results of the hearts of people. How do we get people who change the laws in conflict with Christian standards? How did it happen? How did it happen? The culture is a combined result of the hearts of America that have turned dark. And if those hearts are dark, then there will be no light until their hearts are changed by the power 
of the one source of light. And he is not a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. Some of you aren't going to get what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it loud and clear. I am absolutely positively convinced that this is going to be the church's finest hour. This is it. I believe what you're seeing here. There's been over 200 people baptized in Christ. Why? I'm going to baptize a guy in the beginning of the second service that came to Christ the second time he walked in this building. Second time he's ever in the church. Why? I believe this is the church's finest hour. Because when it is so dark, light is so light. We're the light of the world. Now I'm going to tell you, it will only apply to the true church. It won't apply to the church that thinks they can live a political correct life and stand with lawlessness and God at the same time. It'll happen in the true church. There will be an awakening. Yes, there will be. Our Daniel moment is right now. And whether you end up being a Daniel or a John the Baptist, it doesn't even matter. Whether God rescues you from the opposition or you fall victim to the opposition, it doesn't matter. Our calling is the same. When the dark is the darkest, the light is the brightest. In John 9, 4, you read this during communion today. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. We must quickly carry out the task that has been assigned us by the one who gave us the assignment. What? We're the light of the world. You can't go along with darkness and be light. You're the salt of the earth. You cannot allow yourselves to be defiled by the world and still be salt. Some things must happen. Before he comes so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. But I can tell you today for sure, he's in control. And the only remaining question is this, is he in control of you? He's in control. Is he in control of you? Is he your master? Is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? I close with this encouraging word from the Word of God. And I'm going to say it again. The laws of heaven have not changed. 1 Peter 5, 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God for He cares for you. Stay alert. Watch out. For your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Stand firm, church. Stand firm against Satan. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering that you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered for a little while, he will restore you. He will support you. He will strengthen you. And He will place you on a firm foundation. All power to Him forever. Amen. I'm going to ask Chad to come out. Church, I'm going to tell you today, some things must happen. It's written down. So that you'll not panic. You don't feel like God has lost his attention span or he has now turned us over into the darkness. No, 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 no. Some things must happen. The gospel is going to be preached all over the world and then the end will come. Is he in control of you? That's the last remaining question. We offer this invitation today to respond to that question. Is he in control of you? you.
He invites you under the shelter of his wings. Let's stand. sermons go out on YouTube, and some of you are going to have to realize that you may find yourself in conflict with coming to a church that believes like this. Somebody's going to say where you work, you go to that church that said that stuff, and you're going to have to decide who you are. 
you're going to have to have your Daniel moment. You're going to decide, yeah, I go to that church because that's who I am. Somebody's changed the laws. I'm still going to bow and face Jerusalem. And I'm telling you up front, you better figure out who you are and what you believe. For the love of most will grow cold. Church, all of this is for a reason, to strengthen the bride of Christ, to purify her, to make her ready for the wedding. For he is coming. Oh, yes, he is. Father, today make your bride ready. Make her clean. Father, we don't sell ourselves to somebody else. We are not for sale. We've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Christ has purchased us. You have redeemed us. We are not for sale. We will not bow to false gods. We will not bow to governments that proclaim false gods and tell us to go along. We will not because we already have a king. His name is Jesus. And from everlasting to everlasting, we are his. We pray this in his name. And amen. Thank you for being here today. So clay upon your confession of faith. It is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. So Sherry, upon your confession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. I believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God. I accept Him now as my Lord and Savior. Let me explain something before I baptize Him. Why do we do this? He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You're seeing, you're experiencing the reality of the Word of God manifest in the heart of man. It is my privilege upon your confession to baptize you Step forward. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. <laughs>